This program has been made possible by the friends and partners of Joyce Meyer Ministries. All right, I'm going to talk to you today about divine guidance or hearing God's voice. Probably one of the major, it's not, it's not the top prayer request that we get. The top one that we get is for people's children and their loved ones. And uh, obviously we understand why people are very concerned about their kids that aren't walking with God. But the next one is guidance. So many people need and want to know what to do about specific situations. How many of you are in a situation right now where you really need to hear from God about a decision that you need to make? Okay. Well, see, that's pretty much everybody. And see, the thing is, is we need it all the time. We don't need to just hear from God occasionally. We need to be led and guided by the Holy Spirit every day of our life as long as we're alive. But before I start talking about how to hear from God, I'm going to talk to you for a little bit about obedience. Because there's no point in anybody hearing from God if you haven't already made your mind up that you're going to do what God tells you to do. (laughs) Whatever he tells you to do. And that doesn't mean that you're always going to like what he tells you to do. So we have to be ready for, I'm going to use the word that nobody likes, a little bit of suffering in the flesh. You know, if we want more of God in our life, then there's always a little more flesh that has to go. You know, John said, I must decrease and he must increase. We can't expect to have an increase of God in our life if we're going to just keep doing what we want to do all the time and not make our minds up to listen to God. Maybe we need more teaching on obedience. We should be hungry. I mean hungry to know what God says and what he wants us to do in our lives. Because here's the fact. God is always right. And if we disagree with him, then we are always wrong. God's the only one that can guide our lives in a right way. And I want to say this, and I want you to get this. Anything that God asks you to do or not to do, anything he asks you to give up, is always and only for your benefit. If we really believe that God is good and that he loves us, and he tells us to give up something that we don't want to give up, First of all, it's wrong to disobey God. But secondly, we're only hurting ourselves because everything that he tells us to do is something that's going to give us the life that we say we want to have. But we're not doing the things that we need to do in order to get it. I'll never forget a woman that attended a conference. I tell this story pretty often, but it still amazes me. We were having some kind of a banquet type conference where... And it was all ladies, and they were sitting at these big round tables together, like about eight people at a table. And this, so they had plenty of fellowship time during meals and stuff. And so I, I don't know what I was teaching on, but at the end of the conference, the lady, the lady came to me and she said, well, I know now exactly what my problem is. And I said, well, what is your problem? She said, well, I was abused sexually like you are. And she said, it just so happens. <laughs> All these little things that we think are coincidences and they're really the providence of God. It just so happened that all the ladies at the table with me had a similar background to mine. And she said, as I listened to them talk about their healing and what all God had done in their life and how free they were now. She said, I realized after listening to them that God has told me. The same things that he told them. The only difference is they did it and I didn't. Let that soak in just a little bit. 
If I were to ask right now, and I won't make you raise your hands, although I probably should. If I were to ask right now, how many of you know right now, without me saying another word, that there's something that God has told you to do, or something that he has asked you to stop doing, maybe quite a while ago, and you still haven't done it? <laughs> See, we got people, brave people out there. From the okay, you know what? I'm not trying to be mean. But you'll stay in the same mess you're in and it'll just get worse until you do what God tells you to do. Faith without works is dead. It's great to say I have faith in God, but if I'm not going to do what he tells me to do, then I'm not going to get anywhere. And so maybe some of you will squirm in your seats a little bit this morning. I hope you do. I don't think we should always just be all that comfortable sitting in church. <laughs> okay, so we're going to talk just a little bit about obedience. How many of you have heard the scripture, resist the devil and he will flee from you? Okay. Well, that's actually not what the scripture says. <laughs> that's the part of it we quote. But it actually says, submit yourself to God, resist the devil and he will flee from you. So there's, we have no power over Satan if we're living in known disobedience. Now, I think that God's a little more gracious to us when we're living in ignorance. The apostle Paul said that God gave him grace because he had zeal without knowledge. He was persecuting Christians, but he actually really believed that he was doing the right thing. However, as soon as God showed him otherwise, he was ready and quick to make a change. So if you really don't know that what you're doing is wrong, then God will give you more grace, a space of time. But every time you come to hear the word of God, whether it's watching a TV program or listening to a message or reading the Bible or coming to church, you know what you get? Not just a good message, you get more responsibility. <laughs> because now you know something <laughs> that you didn't know before and so if you keep doing the same dumb stuff you did before you knew the right thing to do now you're going to experience the other side of it well, I thought God's merciful. He is merciful, but sometimes the most merciful thing you can do is not let somebody keep getting away with something that's hurting them. Submit yourself to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee. Now, we're always all going to have trouble with the devil because he hates us. And really, you should be more concerned if he's not giving you any trouble than if he is. Because if, you're, if he's not giving you any trouble, then you're probably not giving him any. However, the best way in the world to give the devil no power over you is to the best of your ability, quickly and promptly do whatever God asks you to do. Quickly and promptly do whatever God asks you to do. Isaiah 119 says, if you're willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. Well, we're all willing, but that's not all the scripture says. It says, if you're willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. I, you know, I'm really excited about what's going to happen in this area in the next week or so, because after me preaching this, boy, you're all going to perk up and you're going to be on your best behavior for a few days. And then somebody will have to come back around and give you a fresh dose. Okay, in Haggai chapter 1, verses 2 through 9, I find an extremely interesting story. It says, thus says the Lord of hosts, these people say, the time has not come that the Lord's house or temple should be rebuilt. So the people were saying, no, it's not time to rebuild the temple. 
Now, in the classic original version of the Amplified Bible, it says in that one, although Cyrus had ordered it done 18 years prior. So the people are still saying, nope, this is not the right time. But God had already told them through a prophet 18 years previously that that was what they needed to do. So they had been being disobedient for 18 years. And you know one of the main reasons why we're disobedient, why we can be really... I mean, people who love God and you got a good heart because we make excuses. Anything that's going to be a little uncomfortable, we can quickly find an excuse why it's not time. And procrastination is so dangerous. It's so deceptive because when we procrastinate, we don't see it as being disobedient because we're going to do it. <laughs> Come on. We plan to do it. We intend to do it, but unless God has told you to wait till another time to obey him, <laughs> then you haven't obeyed until you've done what God asked you to do. Hallelujah. Then the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet saying, is it time for you yourselves to live in your expensive paneled houses while this house of the Lord lies in ruins? So God is saying to them, I told you to rebuild my house, but instead you're building your own house. You know what? We need to be much busier building the kingdom of God than we are trying to increase the size of our portfolio. Now, therefore... Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways and thoughtfully reflect on your conduct. You have planted much, but you have very little harvest. You eat, but you don't have enough. You drink, but you don't have enough to be intoxicated. I'm still kind of wrestling with that. I'm not sure. But, <laughs> but it's there. It's the Bible. So I do want to say I don't think that means you should go all go out and get drunk. But anyway. The mysteries. You clothe yourself, but nobody's warm enough. And he who earns wages earns them just to put them in a bag that has holes in it. <laughs> because God has withheld his blessings. Have you ever felt like that in your life? No matter what I do, it never seems to work out. I remember telling Dave years ago, it seems like no matter, we get, we get a little bit of money saved and something always happens to take it. Well, these people are, are saying, you know, we're working, but we never have enough. We're doing this, but it's never enough. It's, it's never enough. It's never enough. And God's answer to them was consider your ways. Consider your ways. You know, it never hurts to have a little meeting with yourself once in a while. You ever take time to have a meeting with yourself? And just sit down maybe and think about your life and... Think about what you're doing with your time and even just to think about how, how many things are you doing just to please somebody else when really you don't feel in your heart at all it's what you're supposed to be doing. But to keep them from getting upset, you waste your time on stuff that you feel no anointing on. There's no grace on you to do it. You don't even like doing it. And even that kind of stuff is disobedience to God. God has a destiny for each and every one of you. And I can safely say that if you want to fulfill that destiny, there's a pretty good chance you're going to have to make a few people mad. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. Oh, wouldn't we love it if everybody loved us and everybody agreed with us? But surely we can understand that the devil is not going to let that happen. Because approval from people is one of the things that we crave way too much. He's always going to make sure that there's somebody that disapproves, hoping that in order to gain their approval, we will do what they want instead of doing what God wants. Somebody in this building needed to hear that. 
today. Amen. I'll tell you very shortly when God called me to start teaching the group of people that I was around. Women didn't do that. The group of people I was around, nobody talked about people hearing from God. And so when I'm telling them I heard from God and he called me to preach the gospel to the world, I mean, just to make it short, I got asked to leave my church. I lost every friend that I had except maybe one or two. A lot of our families turned against us. And so let me just say plainly that if you want to do what God wants you to do, if you want to have, how many of you want to have the best life that God's got for you? Okay. I mean, do you really? Okay. Well, then there, there is going to be some sacrifice and some hard things and some hard decisions that you're going to have to make. We need a little more backbone and not so much wishbone. I want to see people be strong and believe that they can do whatever God wants them to do and be people that make a decision. I am not going to give up. Devil, you might as well forget me giving up because I am not going to give up. If anybody can have the promises of God, then I can have the promises of God. Verse 7, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways and thoughtfully reflect on your conduct. Verse 8, go up to the hill country, bring lumber, and rebuild my house, that I might be pleased with it and be glorified, accepting it is done for my glory. Verse 9, you look for much harvest, but it comes to little, and even when you bring that home, I blow it away. Why, says the Lord of hosts, because of my house, which lies in ruins, while each of you runs to his own house, eager to enjoy it. Amen. Let me just go ahead and irritate somebody by saying <laughs> that you need to be a generous giver. I mean, a generous giver. If you're going to be part of a church, be part of one that's doing a lot of outreach. I don't, I don't think a church is even a real church if not helping the poor and the needy. If, I mean, if all we're going to do is have a little social club and all get together and try to build our own little kingdom, then we've missed the whole thing. I mean, the way that the world is going to change is by us getting out in the middle of it and loving, really loving people. Because that's one thing that they just don't know what to do with. Especially, especially if you learn how to love your enemies. Hmm. Now see, right away, that's already given somebody some pain. <laughs> if, you, if you listen really good, you'll hear God tell you to help that person that's been mean to you at the office that now has a need. <laughs> see, look at you. Your life. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's how you prove your Christianity. That goes beyond your bumper sticker and the cross you hang around your neck. That says now you're going to put some action to what you say that you are. You know, if we'd get out there and live right, we wouldn't have to do much preaching at all. People would come and ask us for the answers. Hebrews 5.8. Although he was a son, talking about Jesus, who had never been disobedient to the Father, he learned active special obedience through what he suffered. Now, I find that to be very interesting. Jesus was never disobedient, but he learned what it really meant to be obedient by doing the hard things that God asked him to do. And so, see, you can't really learn what it means to really be obedient if you're only going to do the things that you don't mind doing or 
or you like doing or you kind of enjoy doing. Don't think that God won't test you. <laughs> Let me tell you something. There's so many people watching right now. You are in the middle of a big fat test. And I'm telling you, you might as well go ahead and pass it because if you don't, you will get to retake it. In the school of the Holy Spirit, you never flunk out. You just get to keep taking the same test over and over and over until you pass it. Amen. Everybody right now needs to hear from God. It's one of the number one prayer requests that we get. And if we want to hear from God and be led by the Holy Spirit, the first step we need to take is choosing to obey God's word, the Bible. But if you're like me, and I'll just be honest and say, I don't always get this right, this first step every single time. Sometimes I choose to do my own thing and it does not go the way that it should. But there's good news. You see, God doesn't give up on us just because we are not immediately obedient. We find that there is so much good about that, but his grace and mercy, they cover us every day as we continue to dig in and we just become more and more determined to obey his word. You see, I've learned a lot along the way and I've learned that it's better to obey. So if you really want to hear from God, then find out what his word says to you and do your best to do it. We have a couple books, a couple resources to help you do that right now from Joyce. First of all, we have her book called How to Hear from God. It has been around for a while because it's making such an impact and it's really practical and helpful when you want to hear God's voice and separate out all those other voices that are in your head. Then we also have an, a devotional that is a great way for you to begin hearing from God each morning. You'll be seeing what his word says about how you can hear more from him and how you can learn to take that first step right away of being obedient. Well, did you know that helping others has health benefits? It does. Find out how these two work together coming up. The Joyce Meyer Conference is back. If you will start crying out to God on a regular basis, I need more of you in my life. You better put on your seatbelt and get ready for the ride of your life. Coming to Austin, Texas, August 19th and 20th with worship by Pat Barrett. And Hershey, Pennsylvania, November 4th and 5th with worship by Matt Brock. For more information and a complete conference schedule, visit JoyceMeyer.org or call 1-866-C-JOYCE. A celebration 40 years in the making. Register now at JoyceMeyer.org for the Love Life Women's Conference, September 22nd through 24th in St. Louis, Missouri. Register now at JoyceMeyer.org. Did you know that helping others is psychologically good for you? You see, God created us in such a unique and beautiful way that when we help others, it actually does something good for us personally. I love that. We talked with a neurosurgeon who shares exactly how this all works. I'm a neurosurgeon, so I'm a brain surgeon, and I've been in practice now for 20 years. And I think oftentimes we separate our Heavenly Father from science, but yet He's the creator of science, and there really isn't a separation. So what's interesting is, is that God has created us in a unique way that when we give, when we tithe and we give, there is a physiologic response that God has created that helps our minds and helps our bodies literally. And it turns out there are pleasure centers in the frontal lobe, in the front of our brain, our reasoning centers. And when you give, those uh, pleasure centers light up on functional MRI. So that just looks at blood flow in certain parts of your brain when you're using certain parts. And so now you connect God as a loving Heavenly Father and how He's created our brains, and you connect the joy of giving. It changes everything. 
While you're hurting, God will use you to help somebody else if you'll let him. And that's one of the quickest ways to receive your own healing. While you're hurting, you can be in a very difficult situation and you can be there with a smile on your face and a good attitude. And while you're waiting for your breakthrough, you can and should be a blessing to other people. Somebody say amen. So I am excited to be a partner and I'm excited to see all the things that God's doing through Joyce Meyer ministry and he's doing in me physiologically and in, in all of us. Because as we are givers and as we support the ministry, there is a physiologic response that God has created that helps our minds and helps our bodies literally. It affects all 50 trillion cells of our body when we give. And I would encourage anyone that, again, it's not just about I'm giving my time or my money, but this is a supernatural physiologic occurrence that Dave and Joyce have created for us to be able to to help heal others, but also to heal ourselves. I am always and sincerely in awe of how God created us. So detailed how he gave us all of these healing mechanisms in our body. He made things work in such an intricate way that we could have never imagined. He had it all in mind. And you just think of the creativity involved. And he has made it so that we can activate these wonderful things through loving one another. When you hear what Dr. Jackson is saying, it's amazing to see the good that God had in mind for all of us all along and the plan that he had so that we can help one person and they'll help another. And it also helps us along the way. It's just a beautiful cycle of the things that God wants for us. He has good for you. So if you would like to have good for someone else, and also see some of those things happening in your body that Dr. Jackson was just talking about, I've got an idea for you. You could join Joyce Meyer Ministries in partnership. Now you ask, what is partnership? Partnership says that you are going to make a commitment to stand with us as a financial partner, giving and and praying and just being a part of everything that we do here on a regular basis. It is saying that you want to be a part of making a difference in other people's lives every single day. People who are watching this program that you're watching right now, people who are drinking fresh, clean water all over the world, people who are receiving medical help when they need it. There are so many ways that you can help others. Now, it's not all about what you get for yourself. That's not what God had in mind at all. But it is beautiful that when we know in our heart that we're doing what God wants us to when we're helping someone else, something good happens inside of here too. So we hope that you'll join us today. Go to the website, joycemeyer.org, give us a call and join us in partnership and let's see the benefits together. We hope you have enjoyed today's program. Please contact us or visit JoyceMeyer.org to share your prayer requests or partner with us in sharing Christ and loving people all across the globe. This program has been made possible by the friends and partners of Joyce Meyer Ministries. Trong giấc mơ của người giờ đây Có anh không? Người hỡi Bao đâm say ta có bên người còn đâu Làm tuyết trắng mùa đông khóc nhớ
Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Thank you very much. Oh, it's a blessing to be back with you. Like Dwayne said, I've been coming here for 34 years. He was a young man back then. I remember going running with him one time, and I ran eight miles, and it like to have killed me. And we got back, and he says, I'm going to go a little further, and I think he went another 10 miles or something. That guy's an animal. But what a blessing to be here. And I was telling uh, Dwayne and Bernie back there that it's just such a blessing to see what God has done with Res Life. I was here and seen a lot of growth. And to just see them still loving the Lord and loving the same wife, man, that's awesome. You guys are blessed. I don't think you know how blessed you are. Sometimes we take things for granted, but it's just such an honor to see them still doing the same thing and just plugging along. And that's, that's what happens. We have these people come along that are real flashy sometimes and they get all of the attention, but it's the ones that just keep doing the same thing day after day that really see the results. And so it's an honor to be associated with them. Let me mention real quickly that we do have two schools here in this area, one over in Ann Arbor and one here in Grand Rapids, Karis Bible College. And we've got the directors of those two schools here, or they were here in the first service. Are you all here? Stand up if you're around. Here's somebody with the light up here in the balcony. Are both of you up there? Anyway, I think we have a table out here someplace. If you're interested in a Bible college, this is really awesome. We have about 8,000 students worldwide in, uh, uh, I forget how many countries, but 70 different Bible schools outside of the United States. And so anyway, please go check it out. And we have uh, eCaris that you could also take that is all online. And uh, it's, we've got, I think the, Bernie said there was four or five of the staff here that are doing that. And so it's really good. It's the best thing. If I wasn't in full-time ministry, I'd be at Caris Bible College. <laughs> it's awesome. So anyway, that's great. For those of you that were not at the first service, I used uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. And that says, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And I, I was teaching on the balance between grace and faith. If you missed that, I'm going to continue kind of what I taught in the first service. I know that that's some of you that didn't hear it. That may uh, put you at a disadvantage, but you can go to my website and get the teaching. It's all free. I've got a book on this, DVDs and stuff entitled Living in the Balance of grace and faith. And real, I hate to even say real quickly, because if I try and summarize what I said, I'll re-preach it. But uh, real quickly, uh, basically I was saying that grace is God's part, faith is our part, and there's misunderstanding. Some people think faith is what we do to get God to move. No, God moves independent of you prior to you even existing Prior to you even having a need, everything that you receive from God comes through Jesus, and he came 2,000 years ago and did everything. It's finished. Jesus doesn't have to do anything. He's seated at the Father's right hand. Faith doesn't move God. Faith only reaches out and appropriates what God has already given. If it's already given, then that means that there is no burden upon you to do something to get God to move. Now, that's a quick summary of what I said, but I, that's powerful, and that really goes contrary to what most people live. Most people are, they know that God is all-powerful, that He can do anything. They just don't believe He has done anything. They believe He will only move in response to us, and that is completely wrong. Our faith should be in response to Him, not Him responding to us. And you can tell, this is an oversimplification, but I don't mean this critical, but if you think that God is responding to you in what you're doing, you're religious. Amen. I know that could be taken really badly. Uh, Dwayne's going to clean all of this up when I'm gone. <laughs> that could really offend some people, but it's true. 
Religion teaches you've got to do this in order to God, get God to do this. True Christianity is not what you do for God. It's what he did for you already by grace. And you're just responding to what he's already done. And if that isn't clear to you, well, then you're religious. That means that you are, it's man-made. It's not God-made. God is him reaching down to us. Religion is man reaching up to God. So anyway, I talked about all of those things. Over here in Hebrews chapter 4, I'm going to talk to you about the rest of God, and this is kind of an illustration uh, how you can tell whether you are responding to God's grace or whether you are trying to get God to respond to you. Those are two separate things. They're diametrically opposed to each other. One of them produces victory and joy and peace in your life. The other one will wear you out. Amen. I was raised in the Baptist church that taught that, you know, you got saved, and then after you got saved, that you couldn't get healed, you couldn't do anything else. You just had to work for God, do a work for God, and it was all about being a human doing instead of a human being. And we had this little uh, uh, poem that we used to give that said, you know, Mary had a little lamb. It would have been a sheep, but it joined the Baptist church and died from lack of sleep. <laughs> And it was just all doing something for God. And I thought that, you know, my, my dad died when I was 12 years old, and I had fasted when I was 11 and prayed for him. He was in the hospital for months, and I was doing all of these things. And when he died, I just couldn't understand. God, I've done all of these things. Why didn't you heal my dad? And it's frustrating. And this is why a lot of people turn away from the Lord, because they believe that God exists. They believe he can do anything, but they think they have to do something to make God move. And this is why they get into doing so much and they study the Word thinking, God, did you see what I've done? That's not the reason you study the Word is to have God reward you for reading the Word or going to church or paying your tithes. And yet, if you aren't careful, you'll fall into this because this is what religion teaches Religion is teaching basically that God exists, but man, you've got to do all of these things and jump through these hoops in order to get God to move in your life. And I tell you, that'll wear you out. And I've been in ministry now for 52 years, and I've seen people come and go, and I think that probably the number one thing that causes burnout in people is the fact that they are trying to make God do all this. They're trying to live up to this standard and do these things, and it just wears you out. And there's a lot of people that have quit. They still believe in God. They believe He exists. They just believe that, man, there's no way I'm ever going to meet all of the standards. I might as well just quit trying. <laughs> Amen. So there is a rest for the people of God. Look at these verses in Hebrews chapter 4. It says in verse 1, Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into His rest, any of you should seem to come short of it, for unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. And if you read this in context, the third chapter was talking about the children of Israel that came out of the land of Egypt, and uh, they came out of bondage, but they didn't enter into the promised land that God had promised for them. And that entire generation died short of what God wanted them to be. And brothers and sisters, I say this with no joy whatsoever, but the majority of Christians. And I know that this is probably not just your typical church, but I would dare to say that even a lot of people that are right here, you aren't enjoying the fullness of what God has for you. You've come out of being lost. If you were to die, you'd go to be with the Lord, but you aren't enjoying the benefits, the fullness of what God has. That's terrible. It's terrible that we aren't partaking of everything. Jesus purchased healing for us. Man, we should be walking in healing. We should be walking in prosperity. We should be walking in joy. We should be walking in peace. We shouldn't be terrified the way that other people are. And yet there's a lot of Christians that if you were arrested for being a Christian, there wouldn't be enough evidence in your life to convict you. I mean, you're as sick as your neighbor that doesn't know the Lord. You're as poor. You're as worried. You're looking at things that are happening at the riots and you're panicking. You're, you're just as bothered as anybody else. You're like the Israelites that came out of Egypt, but you're dying in the wilderness. You aren't entering into what God has for you. And it says, let us fear lest that happens to us because 
uh, unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that hear it. This is not just magic. It's not like, you know, I've actually seen people when we're casting demons out and somebody goes to manifesting demons. I've had people before hold a Bible up like this. It kind of reminds me of the, uh, uh, what do they call those? The, uh, dra- yeah, vampires. Thank you. I, you watch those things, don't you? <laughs> It reminds me of those vampire movies where they hold a cross up or something and they just can't stand. That's silly. <laughs> First place, vampires are silly. But th- if there were vampires holding a cross or a Bible up, it's not, you know, the devil translated some of these Bibles. <laughs> the Bible by itself doesn't scare people. The Bible says of itself right here in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, that the Word of God is quick. That means alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and joint and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. The true Word of God is a spiritual thing. This Bible represents it, and I believe it represents it perfectly, but This isn't the Bible. This is the representation. The Bible is alive. It's real. And you've got to make it a part of you. And the way you do that is when you mix these words with faith, when it becomes real on the inside of you is when it takes on this life. And so it says you have to mix it with faith. And then in verse 3, it says, For we which have believed do enter into rest. As he said, as I have sworn in my wrath. This is a quotation from Psalms chapter 95, verse 11. And anyway, the wording here in the King James is really awkward. This is one of the most uh, awkward King James translations in the Bible, and I don't have another translation with me right now. So I'm going to summarize some of this to you. But when he's talking here about rest, he's not talking about that. Well, let me just go on and read just a little bit more. It says uh, in verse 3, For we, we which believe do enter into rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if, I shall in, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he spake in a certain place of, of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from his works. So he's likening this rest that he's talking about to the Sabbath rest that God took at creation. And you've got to change your thinking here because most of us, when we talk about rest, you're talking about being tired and you go lay down and rest. But when it says that God rested, this is a quotation from uh, Genesis chapter 2, verse 1, that he rested from all of his works and he blessed or hallowed the Sabbath day because he rested. When he rested, it wasn't because he was tired. God wasn't worn out. It says in Isaiah chapter 40 that the Lord doesn't get weary. God wasn't worn out. It's not like if he made one more star, he was just done for the day. He was, <laughs> he was totally give out. That's not what this is talking about. When it says that he rested, it's like when an artist paints a picture and everything is so perfect that if you add one more brush stroke to that, you're going to ruin the whole thing. And so you put the... the paintbrush now, not because the paintbrush is heavy, but you're resting from your work because it's finished. It's complete. Or a a lawyer will say, I rest my case. That's not because he's so tired that I just, I rest. I, I can't share anymore. No, it means that he's shared everything that there is to share. And so he's through, he's complete. The, when Jesus rested from his work that he had made, It wasn't because he was tired. It was because it was complete. And I'm going to say some things here about creation and just hold with me because I'm going to apply it to you. And there is a direct comparison. That's what he's doing. He says there is a rest for the people of God. And then he starts talking about this rest that God took. So for you to understand the rest that is available to us, you need to understand how God rested. And so again, just for time's sake here, we're limited. I'm just going to summarize some things. But you go back to Genesis and you study Genesis chapter 1, and it is very specific the way the Lord created everything. He didn't just say, let there be trees, let there be grass, let there be cattle, let there be animals, let there be fish in the sea. See, he could have done that. 
But if he would have done it that way, he would have had to have recreated animals, fish, and trees, and grass after the fall entered in and people died. He would have had to have created new things. But if you go back and read in the book of Genesis, it's very specific. He says, let the earth bring forth the tree whose seed is in itself. And everything he created, let the earth bring forth grass whose seed is in itself. Let the uh, earth bring forth animals and, and let the, uh, whose seed is in itself. And he kept talking about this. Everything he created, he created it so perfectly that he has never created anything since. He didn't wake up this morning and create a million new cows to replace all the ones that we <laughs> ate. Did you know that the Lord has never created another tree? God has never created another blade of grass. He's never created another animal. He anticipated, even though he created this not to us not to sin, he anticipated that we would sin. The scripture says he was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. He knew that there would be sin. He knew that eventually death would come into this world that he created. And so he created in every animal, in every living plant, in all of the fish, and in people the ability to procreate. He anticipated all of this, and God hasn't done anything about creation since the original creation. That is significant. Most people don't think about this, but it's really important. And I hadn't got time to go into this, and I mentioned this briefly in the first service, and uh, I'm going to open up a whole can of worms here that I haven't got time to explain, but Pastor Dwayne will straighten all this out <laughs> when I'm gone. But that's the reason I disagree with this humanistic thing that, that we're destroying our planet, that we're exploiting our planet, that we are gonna, we're going to use up all the resources of our planet. God thought through all of these things. Did you know he created, enough, he created enough food on this planet to feed right now 7 billion people? And if we grow to 14 billion people, there will still be enough. He's anticipated anything that we can do, and God made this world to last. I was just reading this last week that he says that he's established the earth to last forever. Now, he's going he's gonna to destroy and create a new heaven and a new earth, but this earth is never going to run out of stuff. Uh, you know, people are talking about we could run out of fossil fuels. I've got a guy that works for me that has built an engine that runs on water. He's, run, he's driven a car 100,000 miles. He's in the process of, of working that thing out. Water can power everything we're doing. There's no limit. God has created everything. The only limit is us and us just not using the resources properly. So anyway, my point in saying all of this is that God thought through creation. Nothing is taking him by surprise. He doesn't have to get up and say, well, man, they're eating all of the animals. I got to create new animals. No, he created in the animals the ability to procreate. And did you know, I, I read in a magazine that there's one stand of trees in Iceland, that that one stand of trees alone is enough to purify the air of the entire world, this one stand of trees. And that's not even including the, you know, the South American rainforest. I've got a friend that works in the Forest Service, and did you know that there's twice as many trees in the United States today as there was when the pilgrims arrived? <laughs> God made things to replenish and stuff. He, when he created, he rested because there was nothing left to do. I mean, there was absolutely nothing. And this is just andeology, but I've spent a lot of time thinking about this. And I believe that God might have spent eons, millions of years, thinking through creation and anticipating everything that could possibly happen and then when he created, it only took six days to create the entire universe and everything, but it had a huge amount of thought going into it. If you look at things on the molecular, uh, man, I could just, I spend a lot of time thinking about these things. But I was flying here on an airplane on Friday and looking at the air and uh, clouds and thinking clouds are awesome. How did God think up all of this stuff? We don't think about it, but it's miraculous. Amen. 
And that plane was flying. It looks like it was flying through nothing. But did you know air? There's all kinds of stuff in here. It looks like there's nothing in between me and you, but there's air. Air is real. And yet we don't see it. We don't take it. For, but God thought through all this. And that plane was just, it was, uh, it was because there is air that that plane was able to fly. Anyway, my point is God is just awesome. He thought through all of this stuff. He thought through creation so well that he even anticipated all of the things that could happen through a fallen world, and he created this earth. And when he rested, it was because it was complete. There is nothing left to do. God doesn't have to, uh, you know, respond to us and, oh, we're going to deplete the planet and we're going to do this. He's anticipated anything we could ever do to mess things up in this world will fix itself. Some of you don't agree with that, and you're entitled to your opinion, but I'm not going to agree with you or we'd both be wrong. So he rested on the seventh day, and it, and it talks about these Old Testament prophecies and says when he rested, that rest wasn't fulfilled when Joshua brought the children of Israel into the promised land because hundreds of years after that, David said in Psalms chapter 95, verse 11, that there is still a rest for the people of God. And so he comes down here and he says uh, in verse 9, there remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God that wasn't fulfilled in type and shadow with Joshua bringing the children of Israel into the promised land. And then he says in verse 10, for he that is entered into his rest, into God's rest, he also has ceased from his own works as God did from his. And so what this is talking about is that God rested because everything was complete. He never has created another thing. He's never done anything new with creation. He rested. It's complete. The only other creation God has ever made is the new creation. You and me, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature or some translations say a new, tran a new creation. Old things are passed away. All things are become new. And here's the application to you, is that just like God created this earth so complete that it self-perpetuates um, itself. Everything was created, everything that we'll ever need. Did you know all of the steel that's in this building? Did you know God anticipated that we would use steel and stuff? And he put in rocks, all of these things, and gave us the knowledge to get it out. And there is knowledge... I heard Oral Roberts one time say that a, a regular slice of white bread has enough power in those atoms that if you could split those atoms in a one slice of white bread, it's enough power to power an ocean liner across the ocean and back. But we can't split those atoms. We can only split unstable atoms like plutonium and uranium and stuff like this. But God has created this universe, has everything that we'll ever need. God has never had to do anything else. Whatever the needs of mankind are, He already anticipated it. It's in creation, and all we've got to do is just figure it out and unlock it and go to using it. Did you know that this wireless microphone we're using, these laws have been in effect since God created things. People didn't know it, so they didn't use it. The air conditioning that we're using, these laws have been here. Did you know electricity has been here since God created the heavens and the earth? He didn't just create electricity a couple of hundred years ago. People are just <laughs> learning these things. But the laws have been here all along. And likewise, when you get born again, God made you a new creation. And just like the original creation, He made you complete. Your spirit is as perfect and complete right this moment as it will ever be in eternity. Thank you for those two amens. <laughs> most people are thinking, no, that's not true. And that's because we, most of us, don't walk in the Spirit. Most of us go by what we see, taste, hear, smell, and feel. Most of us, that's what the Bible calls carnal. We are completely dominated by our five senses and so the Bible says that you have the fullness of the Godhead dwelling in you bodily. And we go look in the mirror and we think, this is it? <laughs> and we see gray hairs and zits and ugly and 
And we think, God, I'm like you. No, it's not talking about your body and it's not talking about your mental part, but in your spirit, you are identical to Jesus. First John chapter four, verse 17 says that herein is our love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is, speaking of Jesus, so are we in this world. Not so are we going to be in the next world, so are we in this world. And see, some people again think, well, I'm not like Jesus because see, you're judging by the outward appearance. You know that your body is different and stuff and your thoughts aren't right. But in the spirit, you are a brand new creature and you are identical to Jesus. He's, he made you as complete in the spirit right the moment you got born again as you will ever be in eternity. Your spirit's not going to be changed. Your spirit's not going to have to be cleansed purge from uh, iniquity or anything. Your spirit right now is as pure and perfect as Jesus is. You have the mind of Christ, 1 Corinthians 2, 16. You know all things, 1 John chapter 2, verse 20. Your spirit's perfect. Your spirit's identical to Jesus. And the rest of the Christian life is learning how to rest in that and say, Father, you made me complete. And the doctor says, you're going to die. All he can do is look at your physical body. He can't see your spirit. But in your spirit, you've got the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 19. It's not out there someplace that you've got to pray and pull it down. See, this is what so many religious people do. It's like, oh God, I believe that you can heal anything. I believe you can do anything. You have done nothing, but you could do it. And so I'm asking you to stretch forth your hand and come and touch this person. You see, you're, you're thinking that he still has to do something to produce healing. No, it was already done. And when you got born again, he put that raising from the dead power on the inside of you, the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. It's not out there. It's in here. And the victory in the Christian life is learning how to rest in this and say, Father, I believe that when you made me, I am a new creation, a new creature, and I have everything, and I am not going to doubt that. Most people believe when the doctor says you're sick, what they do is start moving towards healing. They look at it and say, healing's over here, and in the name of Jesus, I'm going to win a victory. Bernie and I were talking about that earlier, this song, you got to interpret it the right way. It's not wrong to say that we're going to see a victory, but the truth is Jesus has already won it. And we aren't headed towards victory. We're coming from victory. But most people will say, here's healing over here and I'm going to be healed. The moment you say that, you have said, I am not healed, but I'm going to be. And the moment you say that, you have entered, you've allowed the devil to enter in with doubt because, you know, if I said, I'm, I'm going to go from here to the back of this auditorium, you know, I've automatically made myself susceptible to there. Somebody could uh, tackle me as I'm walking towards the back. Somebody could stand in my way and stop me. Something could happen. But if I say, no, I am here. I don't have to go anywhere. I'm here. How can I doubt that I'll get where I am? You can't stop me from getting here. I don't care what you do. I'm already here. But you can stop me from getting back there. See, once you understand that, no, by his stripes, I was healed. First Peter 2, 24, I've got supernatural, the same power that raised Christ from the dead dwelling in me. I keep pointing to my belly because the Bible said, Jesus said, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. This spake he of the spirit. So the spirit, you know, is here in your belly. Some of us look like we got more of the Spirit than others. <laughs> Not so. So I've already got healing. I've got the power of God right here. And once I understand that, no, I'm already healed, then I fight not to get healed, but I fight to defend the healing that Jesus has already given me. See, that's resting in Him. Father, I'm... I don't have to do something to get you to heal me. By your stripes, I was healed. You put this power on the inside of me, and I'm just resting in the fact that it's a done deal. 
Now, that might lead somebody to thinking, well, so you just do nothing. You just sit back and count that everything's done. If you're still in Hebrews chapter 4, I quit with verse 10. Verse 11 says, let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. You could take what I'm saying and say, well, then Jesus has done everything, so I'm just going to sit down and do nothing. Well, it is true that Jesus has done everything, but you have to labor to enter into that rest. It takes effort to renew your mind and to get to where you are not going to trust in yourself. I just prayed with a lady in between the services, and she uh, has a diagnosis of cancer, and she knows the Word of God, and she's strong in the Word of God, and she's believing God. But once that cancer diagnosis was given, she's had some panic come at her and some grief, and she's just been dealing with things. And basically what I was telling her is, you've got more than enough faith to be healed of cancer. It's not a problem, but it's these thoughts of unbelief, and you're going to have to labor to rest in what Jesus has done. And you're going to have to come against those thoughts. And this is where most people are missing the battle. I would suspect that the vast majority of people that go to Rez Life, you have heard the Word of God on healing. You believe it is God's will to heal, and you believe that God heals today. I've seen my wife and my son raised from the dead. My son was dead for five hours in a morgue, stripped naked, in a cooler. They'd already put him in one of the coolers, and they called me, and he just sat up and started talking. And today he's totally healthy and... Praise God. It's a miracle. Most of you in here believe that. And you believe that things like that can happen. But the difference is you don't rest. You don't trust. You don't rely upon the fact that it's done. You think that, God, I know you can do it. You don't doubt that what I'm saying is true. But what do I have to do to get it? You have to quit doing and start resting, and just thank you, Father, that it's done. But in order to rest like that, it takes a lot of effort. Yes, sir. It takes a lot of time in the Word to renew your mind and get to a place to where what God said is more real to you than what the doctor says, than what the banker says, than what the lawyer says, than what the news has to say. There is a lot of effort in resting. Man, that is a powerful statement right there. But you've got to labor to rest. You know, my oldest son, Joshua, when he was one year old, he was running and he fell and hit the corner of a table. It was sharp like this and hit right here on his, on his ear. And when he did, this big old knot came up that was full of uh, stuff and it drained. And anyway, we just prayed over him and believed God for a healing. Did you know that every year for like 12 years, that knot came back on the exact same day every year? I think it was demonic. I can't see any reason why that would happen physically, naturally. But every year that thing would come back and we'd see that knot start coming back and we'd start praying. And after a few years of this, I was like, God, what's going on? I said, I have to rebuke this deal every year. What's what's happening? And he told me, he says, you aren't resting in what I'm doing. You are fighting to get healed instead of fighting because he has been healed. Some of you may not see a difference in that, but there's a huge difference. And all of a sudden, I just said, he's healed. And instead of fasting and praying the way I had all of those previous years, we looked at it and we were, we were having a devotion as he was going to bed and we both started just laughing saying, devil, you are so stupid. When are you going to quit and give up? By his stripes, you, we, he was healed, and we just forgot it and went on, and that's the last time it ever came up. There is a difference. There is a difference than saying, in the name of Jesus, I believe I'm healed, but you are fighting to get healed instead of fighting, defending what Jesus has already given you. You know, I was in the military, and in the military, if you took a, a hill, it was much easier to defend that, that high position than it was to go attack and overcome a hill. You get a defensive position to where you are defending what you already have instead of 
trying to go and get something you don't have. And you, it's just so much easier. This is what makes the Christian life so easy is when you just start resting in what God has done. And like this lady that I prayed with in between the services, I basically just prayed with her primarily that you, she would just be able to overcome the fear, cast down those thoughts, stand there and fight against the unbelief. You don't need a lot of faith. Jesus said if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, if that's tiny. You don't need big faith. It's not your faith that's the problem. It's your unbelief that's the problem. Because we aren't resting in what God has done. We are feeling the responsibility that, God, I've got to do something to make this happen. I'm telling you, this is powerful what I'm saying. I've, I've taken about two hours teaching and condensed it. And so uh, I've got a teaching on the Sabbath rest that would go into a lot more detail. I think I mentioned this in the first, first service, but if you go to our website, awmi.net, I've got 200,000 hours of free material there that you can watch or listen to. So uh, anyway, you can get it, and it will be a blessing to you. If you haven't been resting in the Lord, if this has helped you today and you say, man, I ha I've been feeling like I've got to do something to make God move instead of just trusting what He's already done. And the reason I get in the Word and labor is to change me, not to change God, not to change God's attitude towards me, but to change my attitude towards God. If you haven't understood that, and if God has spoken to you today, and you know what, it's, you have to make a decision that I'm going to mix with faith what God has told me then I want to pray with you today and just uh, help you to receive. I know that this could have quickened your faith because of the COVID things and, and time we are, instead of having you come forward, I just want you, if God has quickened your faith and if you're ready to believe and start resting in what Jesus has already done, I want you to stand right where you are and I'm going to pray for you and we're going to believe God for a miracle. So you could be receiving a healing. You could be receiving prosperity. You could be receiving Jesus as your Lord and Savior. There may be some of you that are thinking, well, I'm coming to church. Will God save me now? It's not about going to church. You know, going to church is like parking a car in a garage. If you're a car, you ought to get into a garage for your own protection. If you're a Christian, you need to go to church. But going to church doesn't make you a Christian any more than sitting in a garage and make you a car. You need to be born again. You need to just receive. Jesus died for your sins. All you have to do is just receive it. So it, whether it's salvation, whether it's healing, prosperity, deliverance, whatever it is that you need, I want you today just to receive, as I pray, to receive the fact that God has already anticipated this. When you got born again, He put within you everything you'll ever need. It's already complete. It's just a matter of you resting in what God has already done. So, Father, we love you, and we thank you so much for Jesus. And thank you, Jesus, for everything you've done. Thank you for what you suffered. You suffered sickness so that I wouldn't have to be sick. You suffered the wrath of your Father so that I would never have to suffer it. Father, thank you that you've already placed all of your wrath upon Jesus. And I pray for my brothers and sisters here today, whatever it is, healing, salvation, deliverance, joy, peace, prosperity, anything. Father, we just now rest in the finished work of Jesus. And we believe, Father, that you are working miracles in people's lives right now. If people don't know you, I pray that right now they would just do what Romans 10, 9 says, confess with their mouth that Jesus is their Lord and believe in their heart that you raised him from the dead and you shall be saved. Father, I speak that over people right now. We thank you, Father, and we receive all of the benefits from what Jesus has already provided. We rest in that in Jesus' name. Amen. Turn it back over to Pastor Andrew, Dwayne. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. brother. Great word. Say, you may be seated. That was just a great word. Appreciate it very, very much. Hey, now, if you were one of the people who stood, and the reason that you stood was you were giving your life to the Lord, uh, we want you to contact us. If you would just text YES to 616-226-3922, we want to be praying for